I wanted to do something a little bit different, uh, maybe a little bit different, maybe not. Uh, as Flink and I were going back and forth about what uh, he was interested in hearing about, he was he attended one of our conferences a, a few years back in Chicago, and so we got to talking about kind of the power of the conference. And so I want to get to that uh, in a second. And and where, where we ended up was sort of this idea of the uh, the power of analog uh, in a digital world. So let me caveat it at the beginning by saying I'm a nerd. I love the internet. I'm really into it. Like don't I'm not some luddite who doesn't understand technology. Although I probably don't understand it as well as most of you do. Um, I did sort of come of age in the mid-90s as a journalist. I, I went to work uh, for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, covering the Olympics. And I got there as an intern. And they gave me my assignment. And it was on the team covering the media. And my parents were so proud because I was just writing about <laughs> a bunch of other journalists. But, but what was interesting about it is I was young. I had just gotten out of college. And what I had had this very forward-looking professor who had kind of put us on the early, the sort of early internet, and we were sort of playing around with email. And I remember like, convincing my uh, girlfriend who was going to Williams College to like, go to her computer lab, and I was going to send her an email, and it took forever, and I might as well have sent her a letter. But you know, it was cool. I was really into it. And then I got uh, done with that internship. Or I got to that internship, and all of a sudden, I was the only one who knew what the internet was. And, and if you go, you think back, way back to 1996, the Atlanta Olympics, the internet was really just sort of coming, coming online. And there were, there were these things happening where you had people listing their houses for rent in Atlanta so that they could get out of Atlanta while everybody was coming in. Um, so they had these listservs. And Michael Johnson, the Olympic athlete who some of you remember, had a website, which was basically like a guy running around with a laptop saying, Michael, how do you feel now? And then posting it up uh, to the web. And it, it seems very antiquated at the time, but it, but it was a big deal. And so I wrote a lot uh, about that. And it led me to my first job, uh, first real job, at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And, and I, got a, I had a choice between writing about technology and venture capital, which was kind of a B grade beat or real estate, which in Atlanta is like the beat. You know, like you're the man if you're writing about real estate because you're like hanging out with all these good old boys and they're telling you about this big old building that's going to be built outside of town and it's going to be the best thing ever. Um, you know, and you're having breakfast with them and hanging out, and or you can go hang out with the hang out with the nerds. So I chose the nerds, but and that was a good choice because of course 96, 97, venture capital really takes off, technology takes off. I got to go work for a startup. So I was working both covering dot coms and working for one, which was a, a harrowing experience to say the least, especially when we went bankrupt in 2001. But you learn the most from the things that don't work. But that led me eventually to Bloomberg. And in 2002, I joined Bloomberg, and I was covering big cap technology companies. So I was very much into technology. Five years into my tenure at Bloomberg in 2007, I was asked to take a new beat, moved to New York and cover private equity. And private equity, I sort of mark that as kind of my analog rebirth in some ways. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. So I, I get to New York. I'm totally overwhelmed. I'm writing about this beat that I really don't know anything about. It's the complicated finance and all these you know, powerful billionaires. And I don't really know how to, how to write about this. And, and the editor-in-chief, our, our then editor-in-chief, our now editor-in-chief emeritus, came over to me one evening and said, you know, How's it going? And I said, I, you know, Matt, I don't know. Like, I'm trying to figure it out. But I said, one thing I know is this is a breakfast, lunch, and dinner beat. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I can't get these guys to talk to me. I can't get them to return my calls. They don't return my emails. The only way that I can get them engaged is to go see them and to be with them and to get them to trust me. And so I really was spending all this time outside the office really getting to know people. And that really sort of triggered this kind of aha moment in my head that as much as I, as a journalist, had come to rely on technology for communication, for my stories. I mean, look, I was at Bloomberg, which is like digital nirvana, right? I mean, it's an electronic newspaper. We have all these media. We you know, were ahead of everybody in terms of creating email and instant messaging and, and all these different things. It's, it's a very electronic place. And yet here I was thinking about the idea that the only way I was really going to get a good scoop was to go and really get to know someone. And so I started to think about that more and more. And so five years into my beat there, I wrote a book, which Ruben was nice enough to mention, about the private equity beat. And, and that 
only deepen my appreciation for how important relationships were in terms of getting information because I was now dealing with these guys on a much different level. And part of it, for those of you um, who've written a book, th this will probably resonate. When you're writing a book versus being an everyday journalist, you create a different sort of relationship. And when you go and speak to someone, you don't have the deadline pressure. And you don't have this pressure of saying, like, I need a headline, or I need a scoop, or I need a whatever. You're asking these pretty, and I'm going to get to this word, and, and Jennifer mentioned it and teed it up nicely, this intimate level with them. And so you start having these conversations. Because I would go in and sit down with people I had interviewed before, and, and before we had been talking about like this deal or that deal. And I would say, tell me about your dad. Tell me about your first job. Tell me about the first time you met Henry Kravis or Steve Schwartzman or whatever it was. And so I started to develop these intimate relationships and started to develop, this is the other word I want to come back to in a few minutes, started to develop some chemistry with these people. And I came to appreciate all, all of that. And so then I moved, after the, my book came out, Bloomberg asked me to do a two-year assignment in our conference business. And for those of you who have put on a conference, and my hat's off to, to Flink and Randy and the rest of the team, it looks so much easier than it is. Because I, you know, I got the job, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go run some conferences. How hard could it be? It's hard. I mean, it's really, really hard. And part of what makes it hard is you're dealing with a whole bunch of people. You're dealing with a whole bunch of people and their sort of peopleness, you know, and their schedules and eating and traveling and all these different things. And yet, I came to appreciate it in lots of different ways because despite all the technology that we have, despite all the different ways that we can connect with each other, here we are. Here we are in a room. Like, we've come from all over the place, near and far, to really be together and to experience each other live and in person. And so we started to think about this very seriously as a team at Bloomberg, because Bloomberg had not been in the conference business for a long time. Even though it was a very you know, personal company, we had resisted the idea of getting into the conference business because we didn't know exactly how we wanted to do it. And, and what we decided to do, and what they had decided to do before I came on, was to really create a conference business that was a manifestation of our journalism. And so if you go to any of our conferences even today, what you see is essentially Bloomberg journalism live on stage. And part of that is Bloomberg's commitment to transparency. But part of it is creating these environments that are, dare I say it, very engaging. Engaging for the people on stage, engaging for the audience in a way that transcends anything that you can do digitally. And I'll get in a few minutes to this notion of how we use the, the digital platforms as well. But one of the things that I, I realized was there were two components. And, and one word that I'm guessing you've heard a lot over the last couple of days, or, and, and we'll continue here, and it's very important to, to all of us, is authenticity. And authenticity is very, very important. I think it's especially important for millennials. Um, I'm finding that in the research for a new book that I'm writing around the business of fitness, that that's a key, key component to all this. But I would submit the two words, uh, and I've mentioned them already, that I really became convinced were critical are intimacy. And intimacy is not necessarily romantic, although we, I'm sure we could all use more of that. Um, but it really is this notion of kind of breaking down the walls um, between what, between us as human beings. And when you interview someone on stage, it is a surprisingly intimate encounter, despite the fact that there's an audience in front of you, that there are people watching you on TV or, or what have you, but there's a, there's a vulnerability to it. And, and I, I've been fascinated over the years to interview very, very powerful men and women, you know, true captains of industry, uh, investors or CEOs or, or, or what have you, who get up on that stage or you're backstage with them and they are straight up legit scared. Like, I mean, they, they, this is not necessarily a, a comfortable position for them. But it, that translates well, actually, to an audience. And, and an audience really picks up on that. And, and I would argue that it creates an environment for a lot deeper engagement even once they, once they come off stage. And so the other word that I would point you to is chemistry. And so we spend a lot of time at Bloomberg when we're doing our conferences thinking about how do we create chemistry among people 
on stage. And a lot of that is making sure that we have the right moderators, making sure that they're prepared, making sure that the people we're interviewing are prepared to go on stage. And it's really important, and it's something that I've learned so, so both as a journalist um, and as a producer. And so when you, when you really, and this is a word that um, a former boss of mine really hates, and so I, I say it with some trepidation, when you really curate the experience, when you really work around all sides of it, um, it, it creates something very, very interesting. So I want to show you a very quick video of how it sometimes uh, comes together. So just to tee this up, so this was a conference that we did uh, in uh, Sausalito last year. And, uh, it, and so this guy, um, Chamath, I'm not going to say his last name, um, but you can read it, had just been interviewed by one of our anchors and uh, a, a, about sort of income inequality and infrastructure in San Francisco. And, so, and then there was a, uh, a pretty well-known venture capitalist named Ron Conway who was sitting in the audience. So Emily and uh, Emily Chang, our anchor, and Chamath are going off stage, and, uh, and Ron Conway stands up. So I'm going to play this for you. It's fairly quick. So here's Ron. You the bald say, guy over there is me. And I quote, city of San Francisco is writing checks to subsidize rents and outrageous tenant improvements. That is false. The city of San Francisco provided a payroll tax reduction to employees in the Twitter building, and then that was voted in with Prop E. The city of San Francisco does not subsidize rents and tenant out. improvements. Ed Lee, who you ridiculed, how dare you, Palo Alto resident. <laughs> the worst insult you can get. Put out a mandate to build 30,000 new housing units by 2020 in San Francisco. 30% of them dedicated to affordable housing. All right, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to stop there. But you see what happened there which from a producer's perspective was awesome. Like you can't buy this stuff, like you can't set this up. Um, <laughs> it was, and it, it was not set up, it was totally natural. But you know, what I thought, sitting up there on stage like slightly nervous, but also thinking this is fantastic, was we had created an environment where obviously this guy, Ron Conway got very agitated, but had created an environment that was intimate, the chemistry was there, and this, and obviously, Ron Conway, quite engaged uh, in, in, in this conversation. So, you know, I use that as an example of, sort of, of sort, of, sort of how it all comes together. So I guess, before I open it up for questions, I want to make sure that I sort of translate the analog to the digital. Um, and I was a beneficiary, and our group was a beneficiary, actually, of some very great work um, by RJI, because they helped us, a, a group of really kick-ass students, helped us put together a plan um, whereby we could take things like this and make sure that the world saw them. And so part of curating, as it were, these analog experiences is making sure there is digital distribution for them, whether it is in short video clips, longer video clips, social, all the things that you guys have been talking about in depth. But I would tell you that one of the key, key things in order to have those digital assets is to make sure that you have a really, really powerful, well thought through, intimate, chemical, analog experience. So, happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, so questions for, from the audience. Uh, just one of the things, um, you know, in terms of the intimacy question, like how do you do that? How do you get intimacy in a way that isn't sort of awkward and uncomfortable and sort of things you shouldn't do? You know, I think what it is is I, one of the things I discovered as I was producing with, uh, especially working with our journalists, is that not every journalist, they may be great interviewers, they may be great writers, they may be a great interview great interviewer one-on-one -on -one in someone's office or something like that. But being on stage, I think, takes a different level of confidence and also a different level of preparation. So one of the things that I think you have to do is really emphasize preparation um, for folks who are, who are doing that sort of thing. And part of it is 
making sure when you can, and this is where sort of chemistry and intimacy overlap, is this idea that you, if at all possible, spend a little bit of time with the person who you're going to interview to develop that little bit of rapport so that they're not sort of coming cold to it. Um, you know, so that's one thing that, that I think really comes through. And I think the other thing is, you know, we're often doing, you know, 20, 30 minute interviews. And part of it is going through the interview in your mind ahead of time and kind of understanding the arc of the conversation. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what's the story ultimately we're trying to tell because I think too many times when you go to a conference or when you're, when you're speaking at a conference or when you're especially doing a panel or something like that, you have your list of questions, you sort of tell people what you're gonna say and you kind of go like question one, question two, question three. And so sort of freeing yourself from that and understanding that I wanna get from A to F and I'm gonna hit these points along the way, but I may go here and then there. I'm gonna sort of take the conversation where it goes because intimacy essentially comes from comfort, right? And the more comfortable somebody is, the more open they're gonna be um, to, to wherever the, the conversation is gonna go. And I think part of it, especially with panel discussions, is being comfortable being a little more human. I, I mean, one of the most disarming things I think you can do when you're interviewing someone or even having a panel discussion is not being, you know, that we're not curing cancer at a, at a panel on business, right? I mean, like, it, it, it's, you know, you need to sort of gauge that and bring out that humanity wherever possible. Jason, I want to ask you a, a two-part question. Okay. One is, um, one of the things that I experienced when I went to Chicago with your conference was the exponential value that everyone in the room translated into that experience, both on the source side, but also on the audience side in terms of engagement and um, trust mm -hmm. and loyalty that seemed to go like 16 stages all at once, right? Right. And, and then secondly, the second part of that is how do newsrooms do that because we all recognize the value of the town hall and our role, especially for news organizations in terms of facilitating those kind of conversations, but we don't all have Bloomberg cash, right? Right. And so how do we do that? So that's two parts. Would you agree with the first assessment and then help with the second? I, I agree with the first in the sense that I think, and I meant to say this earlier, so I'm glad you reminded me. I think part of creating that, that on stage environment and creating something where the, the subject is much more vulnerable or human in some ways opens them up to the audience in a way that is much more approachable. And one of the things we do with our conferences is, and I think you probably saw this in Chicago, we, we tend to, uh, in, in most cases, unless they're sort of security concerns um, <coughs> or security demands, I should say, we have a, our green room, as it were, is out in the open. So our speakers are sort of coming together, you know, and one of the coolest things, you know, I saw at that specific conference was, you know, Henry Kravis and Prince Al Walid from Saudi Arabia and Chuck Schwab, like, broing out, you know, like, like amid everybody else and, and everybody who was there sort of felt that openness and that willingness to sort of come and, and be and be part of the mix. Because I think that's that's a really important element of engagement is people feeling like, okay, I'm here among my peers and there's not this sharp divide between, you know, kind of who's up there and who's down here. And so I think whatever you can do to break that down is is um, you become an insider, so so to correct. Speak. That's exactly right. And and you and I think by doing that you implicitly sort of build this community um, that people feel uh, a part of. So the second question, sorry, say it. How do, how do newsrooms do that in a way, because everybody has a newsrooms that are taxed and maxed already, yeah. right? How do newsrooms do it internally or how do they Externally, do it how do externally? they do the kinds of things that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think especially if you're on a local beat um, and I try, you know, being in New York, I, obviously, and my beat was very New York based, you know, I had the benefit of that. I think it's always pushing for, always pushing to be in person if you can. You know, which, you know, go to the person's office. You know, I mean, which, I mean, this sounds so basic, but at the same time, I feel like I have to be reminded of it a lot of times, and I remind people of it a lot of times. The power of seeing someone in their natural habitat, I think, is underestimated. 
And I think being able to describe that journalistically, but also to speak with someone in, in their environment puts them at a comfort level. And I think it also gives you insights that you might not otherwise get. And I think, quite honestly, people are much more engaged face-to-face -face than they are on the phone, which is not to say you can't sort of do a good phone interview, but I never do email interview. I mean, I think email interviews are a waste of time. Um, if I'm trying to get anything more than basic information, I mean, I really want to talk to someone and, and sort of get to know them. I mean, I've been working on a story that's coming out tomorrow, and I you know, was able to go to this guy's apartment and like spend hours with him for ultimately four or five quotes, but I guarantee that those quotes were better because we spent a huge amount of time together um, in a you know, pretty intimate setting. Okay. Jason Kelly, thank you very much. Thank you.